Coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. And we're joined today as well by a bunch of interns. <laughs> I would say the conservative movement is depraved and the <laughs> GOP no is today. stupid at this point. Okay. Again, we're just bringing you the voice of the youth. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why every minute of every day, everyone is thinking constantly about transsexuals. You know, it's like the brainworms have totally saturated society. Going to meetings and, 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 and yelling at elected officials. This is, this is so salutary. It's like, it's almost, uh, it's like my cup runneth over. Spencer, you're an honorary Zoomer, even if you know, I, you're not within the, the age demographic. <laughs> I, I, I would almost just shut the podcast down for, for your having said that, <laughs> Nate. I, I, if we don't have that, then politics is gone and, you know, on our, our way of life and our form of government with it. You know, these average middle and working class parents that aren't even necessarily registered Republicans or self-identified conservatives all the time pushing back and being like, you are not going to teach our kids this, right? Like, we love our country. You can't teach our kids this is an evil country. You can't teach our kids to hate each other based on race. We still believe in the principles of the Declaration of Independence, right? Like, that's America. America is not the sort of you know, corporations with pride flags and, you know, gender studies programs for Saudi Arabia and all the things that we're used to, to complaining about, right? Like America is the parents at the school board meeting demanding that teachers don't teach their children to hate each other based on the color of their skin. Welcome, everyone, once again to the Roundtable, the publishers and editors podcast here at the American Mind at the Claremont Institute. I'm your host, Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute, publisher of the Claremont Review Books. I'm joined by Matthew Peterson, uh, founding editor of the American Mind, vice president of education, Spencer Clavin, features editor of the American Mind, associate editor of the Claremont Review Books, James Pullis, executive editor of the American Mind, and Seth Barron, the uh, Managing? Yeah, managing editor of the American Mind. And we're joined today as well by a bunch of interns. <laughs> uh, rather than uh, me introduce them, I thought we'd go uh, around the horn. Uh, one of them, at least, is uh, you know Clubhouse famous, our own Nate Hawkman. So we'll start with him. Yeah, Clubhouse semi-famous. <laughs> uh, Nate Hawkman, I'm uh, here for the summer, an editorial intern at the American Mind, doing the Publius Fellowship with Claremont in uh, a week coming up here. And uh, just really excited to be on the podcast. Where'd, uh, where'd you go to school, Nate? Colorado College out mm. in Colorado Springs. And you graduated, what, a couple years ago? Uh, a couple months ago. A couple months, yeah. oh, right, yes, yep. correct. All right, next. Uh, I'm Wyatt Verlin. Um, I went to DePaul University. I'm an intern here at, for the American Mind as well this summer. Just very excited to be on this podcast as well. Michael Kaplan, recent UCSB graduate, interned here at the California office for the Claremont Institute. And uh, America is the best regime. Very glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we train them fast here at Claremont. Uh, last but not least, Blaze. Blaze Ebener, and I'm going to Azusa Pacific University, just right down the street from the Claremont Institute. And I'm going to be interning, interning here too over the summer and into the fall. Excellent. And Blaze, you're coming to us from Idaho, right? And you're yep. scouting the Mountain West for yep. uh, bunkers and compounds. The... Yeah. Yep. Excellent. All right. I thought I'd start off uh, uh, with, um, you know, we've got the assembled Utes here, as we say, from my cousin Vinny. That's a that's an old reference for you youngins. So I just wanted to start off with uh, a sort of rapid round and we can go from there. But if you uh, if you had to use one word to describe, I'm going to actually change it to two things now. One word to describe the conservative movement and one word to describe the GOP, if you think those deserve different words. Nate. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, this is I'll put it, definitely putting me on the spot with the second question. I think that the conservative movement is decadent um, and the GOP. <laughs> I don't want to be hyperbolic, but right now the GOP is pathetic, I think, if I had to use one word. <laughs> All right. We're, we're starting hot out of the gate. <laughs> Why? Uh, I would say the conservative movement is depraved and the <laughs> GOP is other. stupid at this point. Okay. Again, we're just bringing you the voice of the youth, everyone. <laughs> Michael. It's hard to follow those ones up. I'd say the conservative movement is disillusioned and the GOP is decrepit. Hmm. Nice illusion there. That's good. Place. 
I, I would say the conservative movement's probably at least struggling right now and um, the GOP is just weak. And that's our show. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been funny if I just went like the conservative movement is fantastic. There's nothing wrong with it. GOP yeah. is <laughs> winning. Uh, no, that's um, <clears throat> this isn't a turning point podcast. Um, <laughs> excellent. Well, good. Thank, thank you, guys. Um, I, I wanted to start. Maybe we could talk a little bit about. Uh, well, first, let's let's go to our veteran podcasters and any responses to those gents. None. Okay. Well, uh, that's all right. <laughs> well, I mean, we do talk about it every week. Yeah, um, it's true. I mean, I don't know. It's a family podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but Matt, actually, you had a, a recent experience, um, which you tweeted about, uh, I think today, uh, maybe yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, up, in, up in Montana, meeting with Chris Rufo and others about to talk about critical race theory. And uh, you were encouraged by that episode, weren't you? Yeah, I think that... Um, there's so many subgroups and sniping and uh, any kind of transitional time where there's a vacuum of leadership in the conservative movement or, you know, God forbid, the Republican Party. Uh, you're going to have all these all these kind of uh, factions, you know, taking shots at each other and, and trying to claw their way to the top. And that's all good. It's normal. It's natural. But I think what people need to realize is that um, a lot of these the themes of 21st century, you know, American right are already being defined on the ground. And in, in the, this case, this was a, a meeting in Montana that people are already griping about online um, with a number of people who are dedicated to fighting critical race theory, as Chris Rufo calls it, and has very successfully named it and fought it. And um, you see an organic movement where you have parents of all kinds rising up and and taking kind of activist activist steps forward and that's happening organically around the country regardless of what conservatives or their critics or the republican party and its critics are doing and so it's it, people are much more aware of these things than i think a lot of intellectuals or commentators online um, realize and there really is something something happening regardless of what people say on Twitter. And so I, I was um, I was very encouraged by it. I was encouraged by how strong um, many people actually you know, are on this issue, uh, how clearly they see how evil it is and how they're operating in, in different ways to combat it. And, you know, there, what gets lost in a lot of these 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 griping wars are um, is the fact that politics is about coalition building. And that's just the way it is. It's the way it's always been. And so I think, um, you know, a lot of good things are happening on the ground. The question is, how does that shape the conservative movement and the Republican Party? And, and that's really what's at stake right now. I have a question about that, Matt, because the CRT success we've been seeing lately on school boards, in local governments, at the state level, I agree, hugely heartening and a rare, a rare moment of victory, right? I mean, because it's not, I don't, I don't want to, I actually don't have any uh, critiques or disagreements with the characterizations that our interns gave of, of the GOP, but I, I do want to highlight this as like, a, it's almost shocking. It's sort of like, we're, we're, we're winning? I mean, how did, how did that happen? And, and I think you, you identify one important tactic that Rufo really spearheaded, and that was giving, giving the thing a name, right? I mean, calling it critical race theory, picking one of their many ridiculous sort of jargon laden terms and just nailing that to the wall. And you can tell because that's what the lefties are most hair on fire about. What were some other tactics that you took away from this? And do you think that they are translatable into other areas? Because CRT is an important one, education near and dear to my heart, obviously. But there are so many others, right? I mean, was there like a workable strategy in place for bringing this into foreign policy and uh, the trans stuff, you know, anywhere else besides CRT? Yeah, I think I think there was. I, I think that the um, the naming, um, this is something that Ryan and the Claremont Institute as a whole has, have been about for a while, naming the actual regime threats, um, right? The Center for the American Way of Life Claremont has in D.C. I mean, getting people to talk about what is actually looming on the, you know, landscape that we can see with our eyes is really important. So. You know, critical race theory is a good example. That's not what I would have called it. 
it's not, you know, but no one really had a name, but that name stuck and it stuck for a reason. And it, it allowed him to pin down, right, a bunch of bad things that he right. shows in his tweet threads with a bunch of a bunch of actual examples to an overarching problem. And you can see them backpedaling and denying it. Right. And because they know that it's it, their squirrely way of doing this has been pinned down. So I would say when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to everything else, that's really important. Naming naming something is means that there's a unified right bad thing that all the examples fall under. You're, you're naming a universal. And I think that that's number one. Uh, number two and three, um, there's probably three major themes. N number two is the activism. I mean, the fact that um, regardless of what uh, intellectuals and people uh, who write in our publications say, there are people on the ground who are looking for particular examples. They're filing Freedom of Information Acts. They're, they're trying to nail down what's actually going on in their school system, say, and that's, of course, um, that's that's basically what journalism would do normally. But we don't have real journalism, you know, for the right. So, people in other areas of, of politics, you know, need to bring out in simple ways the actual examples of the problem. And you could apply that to uh, to any other major issue in America. And that work has to be done by by activists because it's not going to be done by the media. And then you have to use like Rufo and others do uh, social media, et cetera, to kind of spread the word. And so the, the first the first thing, once you've identified the enemy is, OK, now let's get some examples of what's actually going on on the ground and then reach the people for whom uh, who are affected. And you see this being successfully done with the school boards and the school districts. Very interesting examples um, throughout the country of people who carefully, uh, given the situation they're in, politically maneuvered to find allies, right? And uh, get a coalition together to start fighting some of this stuff. And so it, it's not as simple as just speaking out, it's it's finding examples that piss everyone off and then going to constituencies that are local or regional or they're, be, they're being affected and then, uh, and then you know, getting them together and, and starting to press forward. And then third, I would say, I think there's a lot of people in this particular issue when it comes to combating critical race theory who understand there's a kind of accelerationist level here, like reduce it to the absurd, encourage the other side to go all the way, right? So put the, put the as, as Peter Bogosian has on his, uh, on his Twitter, um, put, the, put the quit back into equity. If you really believe in equity <laughs> and you're uh, a white privileged person, you should quit now and leave your job and make sure people of the proper color or whatever class are, are put into position. And there's a lot of ways in which you can do that where uh, you kind of get ahead of the other side rhetorically and you push in, in very belligerent in a very belligerent manner. And I think as far as the larger rhetorical game, uh, people were they understood that and they understood that you're not going to win by, you know, making some kind of uh, some kind of argument and principle and purpose and laying out syllogisms. The other side doesn't care. But what you can do to combat them is to take it all the way, all the way to the 100%, like where does this end level? And by doing that, you signal to people who are interested or open that, wow, this really is absurd. And you, you directly assault the other side. And, you know, I think people are, are catching on to this. And it, it does give me a lot of, a lot of hope because I, I think that it's easy to kind of write off the American people, write off the American regime, when the fact is, for good and ill, a lot of people just are tuned out, don't pay attention to this stuff, and aren't very activated in their life. They're not living a purpose-filled life. But when these things are revealed to them, when and it's explained in very simple terms how this hurts them, you know, they don't react kindly. So, you know, there's there's hope there. I mean, if, of course, this kind of energy needs to be channeled, and and how and if it shapes the American right, we'll see. But uh, but I would say it's almost as if if you know if if the institutions on the right don't get out in front of this and don't don't lead, um, you know, they're just not going to be a part of what's going on on the ground or the real the real battles and, and the real fight. So it, it emboldened me to, to continue in American mind to do more highlighting of, of what's actually happening and what people are doing that's successful when it comes to both critical race theory and otherwise. Uh, yeah, I want to expand on on all this with a few observations. It, it seems to me that the real context here is 
considerably larger and more significant even than race itself. Um, and that context is that people are hypnotized right now. They are hypnotized by the sudden absolute dominance of technology over every aspect of life. And they are hypnotized by the mystical powers that technology seems to confer on those who wield it. People are turning into cyborgs before our very eyes. I mean, you know, we all walk around with smartphones all the time, every day. And over the course of the pandemic, many people used their smartphone phones more than they used, like walking around outside, talking to fellow human beings. Um, so like the, you know, the, the, the lobster has already been boiled in that regard, but there's, you know, there's a reason why every minute of every day, everyone is thinking constantly about transsexuals. You know, it's like the brainworms have totally saturated society. You can't get on the internet without coming across this, this topic of discourse. And it's because, you know, the transsexuals are the, the, the bleeding edge of cyborg life. You know, they're not really transitioning from one sex into another. They're transitioning from totally human to partly human and partly technology. And so people are like, you know, there's this vapor lock where people are just sort of like gasping for some kind of purchase, some possibility of exercising their agency and taking action, not just thinking about things, not just talking about things, but actually moving their bodies and their souls in concert in recognizably human space and time. And the question is, how do you how do you even begin to organize that kind of activity in this moment? And so, you know, I think that like CRT has caught on because it is one of those three letter acronyms that has this kind of powerful incantation value in American life. I mean, from our, you know, from our government agencies all the way down to, you know, our favorite catchphrases, our corporations, like the three letter acronym is very powerful. I suspect that's one reason why it caught on. But critical race theory, you know, the theory is the practice. Like it, it, when, when Ronald Reagan was asked, like, what is your strategy for the Cold War? Um, he was basically being asked what his theory of the case was. And his reply was, we win, you lose. That's what critical race theory is. It's they win and we lose. And so what's our guy's practice? It can't be just purifying speech, you know, and Matt has to deal with this all the time. People to his right going like, no, you must, you must purify the doctrines. You can't take action first. This is madness. And then people to his left saying the same thing, just in a different way. Um, you're trying to find that perfect language of criticism is just going to deepen the, the paralysis field that people feel caught in, you know, whether you're, you're trying to purify language from, from a relatively more base or a relatively more cringe perspective, like that doesn't really matter sociologically speaking. So it's, you know, it's political action that restores human space and time that really matters right now. It's not just passing laws. It's not just banning things. You know, that's, that's all well and good if you, if you legislate wisely, but it's about citizenship. It's about pulling the soul outward. It's about pulling people away from this hypnosis of like technology and cyborg life that has us confused that knowledge is the ultimate source of mystical power. Like it's not knowledge, it's, it's like collective action and it's things that pull people out of their like inner trip and their labyrinth and gets them actually blood pumping, minds and bodies engaged, working together as citizens. And if we don't have that, then politics is gone and you know, on our, our way of life and our form of government with it. Yeah, pick yeah I, totally, uh, I totally agree with everything James and Matt said. And uh, I appreciate our uh, interns perspective on the uh, state of the conservative movement and the Republican Party. Very, very um, creative, creative uh, adjectives there. I think they were great. Um, yeah, I mean, what's great about about what's happening now in the push against CRT is that the left has the left is in power and they're so transcendently powerful that they can't lose anywhere. Any loss is defeat. So the fact that they're losing on this issue is just tremendous and that they're losing in the way they're losing that people in the way James described people are standing up physically like verbally going to meetings like organizing I mean this is these are their these are their tactics right protests going to meetings and and and, and yelling at elected officials this is this is so salutary it's like it's almost uh, it's like my cup runneth over. <laughs> it's the type of thing where because the thing is, they can't back down from it. All they can do is deflect and say, well, you're, that's not really what we're talking about. So much of what they do is semantic word games like with trans women or women. 
well, what are women? Uh, well, you, trans women are not women. Well, you just said they're women, trans women. CRT, critical race theory, why are you against talking about race? Well, we're not. It's, it's wonderful to see, and I just think we have to press forward on it. It's like what Lenin said, like, you know, you, 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 you push until you hit steel. And if you hit fat, you just keep going. This, you know, I, I don't know. I, I like to think that this could maybe, um, this could really, like, hit the, the sinews of what they're all about and reveal a lot of their untruths. I, I think yeah. in, mm, insofar as I can, like, offer an intern perspective that's at all <laughs> interesting to the, uh, to the American Mind podcast audience, um, it's not a white pill, but I think it's a reason for optimism. And this is something that I think you guys are all obviously aware of is one of the reasons for optimism is that there's a generational divide in the conservative movement. This is something, Ryan, I've, I've talked to you about uh, offline and that I'm interested in, in writing about. But the young conservatives, by and large, understand the problems that we're talking about and the problems that American Mind and Claremont in particular focused on a lot more vividly than I think our, a lot of our older counterparts, present company excluded, obviously. <laughs> um, but the, Did I, you just call me a boomer? <laughs> not, well, not, not boomers. Actually, you know, Gen, Gen X is probably straddling the line there. But the, the reasons for this are, are multifaceted, obviously. One of them is just the fact that you know, conservatives and right-wingers our age are coming into the world without all the entrenched dogmas and sort of Reagan-era slogans and, and, and orthodoxies that older folks have sort of inherited and, and have sort of just settled in as, as uh, you know, repeat the, the slogan about limited government and free market ad nauseum and everything will work out. And, but the other thing is just the campus left is more radical and more ambitious now than they were 30 years ago. And for young conservatives who have spent time on college campuses recently, or sometimes they're still in college, sometimes they just graduated college, we're seeing exactly what that actually looks like. And when we're seeing you know, the president of the United States, the heads of the Democratic Party, the heads of big business start to use the language that we're used to seeing from campus activists. We actually understand much more vividly just what that means and just what the radical ramifications of that are a lot more than folks who are just hearing the word critical race theory for the first time, right? So like when I hear someone talk about any number, invoke sort of any number of, of woke slogans, I know exactly what that means. And I would wager that like any conservative who spent time on college campus recently knows what that means. Whereas like the president of, you know, ex think tank, who's, you know, 65, 70 years old is hearing this word for the first time and they don't fully understand it. So I think like understanding what time it is and understanding just like the context of how radical the regime has become is something that is just much more natural to folks who have actually had a much more direct experience with this. This is one of the reasons I'm so attracted to the American mind. Like you guys, are, you feel like you know some of the only people who really get it. But I, I think your message obviously is going to have much more appeal to people within my age demographic uh, than it is to older folks who really don't understand what we're talking about when we talk about these things. I think just for another intern perspective, though, as well. I mean, just to push back a little bit. I think there isn't. You guys are your own human beings. You don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have to we present myself as a podcast. Part of my contract. <clears throat> I, I think there's a need for some pessimism around some of the opposition to CRT in the sense that it's this is all coming really spontaneously and it doesn't actually have um, the complete backing of the conservative quote unquote movement, um, which still wants to talk about like socialism or something. Well, it depends what conservative movement you're talking That's about. That's true. I, I don't but, really know. I mean, I, I, I'm curious what you guys think, but I, I don't really know that there is like a coherent conservative movement anymore like there was, you know, in the Reagan era. Like we're talking about, to me, we're living in different worlds from the sort of like sort of entrenched beltway conservative movement. Like I, I don't even see those people as like part of the same. I mean, they're broadly part of the same political coalition, but I really I, I really feel like we inhabit different realities. Like, you know, so. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, I'm just saying that the sort of the opposition, a lot of the opposition at the local level to CRT has just been like local groups forming completely spontaneously from parents. And I'm not sure that we can actually translate that into seizing back power at any time. I don't know. They're or talking. They're talking. Tucker Carlson is one of the most watched you know, conservative talk show hosts in America, right? He's talking about critical race theory almost every night. So, yeah, but he only has like I think it's like three million viewers a night. So, yeah, as as um... <laughs> only. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's a, you know, a country I mean, of three hundred fifty million people. Tucker's it's... Tucker's yeah. clearly pretty influential. I, I wouldn't necessarily say he's a kingmaker, but he's someone who like genuinely, you know, Republican politicians are worried if if Tucker comes after them. Yeah, sure. If you're talking about translating groundswell movement into 
you know, actual, as it were, structural change within the apparatus of the party, I think it's fair to point to Tucker as somebody who might like be that hinge or inflection point. I mean, I have a question for you guys, because I think when you're talking about these schisms within the conservative movement or the conservative movements, right, uh, you're outlining one of the major fault lines. And that is actually not wholly defined by age, although you got more young people on one side and more older people on another, right? But we talk a lot on this podcast that this boomer energy is different from being a boomer in the sense of being born this at a certain time, yeah. right? There's yeah. this question of like, of do you know what time it is? And Nate, that lived experience that you're talking about, <laughs> right? Like the thing where you have come up through whatever college education or whatever, you know, high school, even high school experience, uh, seeing what these people do on the ground and seeing what these buzzwords actually mean and what they translate to. I, I get that sense as well as somebody who's clinging still tenuously to the designation of like youthful, right? I, I hear that a lot from people just younger, just a little younger than me that like, I know these people, I know what they, I know they mean business, I know who they are and your stupid boomer slogans about like, you know, low taxes or uh, licensing reform genuinely do not set a fire in my heart because there's more important stuff to be carried. See, Spencer, on. you're an honorary Zoomer, even if you know, I, you're not within the, the age <laughs> demographic. <laughs> I, I, I would almost just shut the podcast down for, ha for your having said that, <laughs> Nate. I, I, I feel, I'm, After I'm the White Boy Summer Substack, I think we title, accepted but it. I, yeah. I, I want to know from you guys whether, because I feel like one of the things that that then occasions is just a disgust with like conservatism as an idea or, you know, there, there's or even indeed at the at the deepest level sometimes with like the American regime. I mean, you, you start out by saying the American regime is the best regime. Well, that's not what I'm hearing always from people <laughs> who have exactly this reaction. Right. right. A lot of people, this is like they're, they're, what they're disgusted with is a country that they've only ever known as kind of institutionally endorsing this form this rabid form of like you know brain worm infected racism and and weird sexuality right like is that um too black pilled or do you think that there's some work to do in reconciling these yeah. things that, do you see what i'm saying well i mean i people who know me know that i have like very little time for the sort of right-wing anti-americanism i've probably been more aggressive in in, in um in <laughs> expressing that opinion online than i should be you know i've gotten into like arguments with adrian vermule on, on twitter about this but i just i, I think like who hasn't who, well who yeah this is, this, is, this is true but um you know i think you have to be able to separate the regime from the country right Precisely. and i mean and i i still love this country i don't just love this country as an idea i love the american people i love most of America, actually, when you still go to it, right, is separate from the constant sort of like blaring drumbeat of wokeness and critical race theory that you hear from the, the, the imperial city in D.C. and, you know, the centers of power in, in New York and L.A., right? Like most of America is still recognizably America. And I think like the young right wingers who are like it's all completely gone you know, maybe America might have been great once or maybe it was never great. But, you know, this it's we, we live in this sort of decrepit, broken country. It's like, no, no, actually, that's not true. Like, there's actually a lot of vital energy and the American spirit is still alive in large portions of the country, even if it's completely absent from from the ruling class. And if you if you want an example of that, just look at the grassroots energy uh, around critical race theory. Right. I mean, the, the conservative movement is is indicative of this sort of broken, pathetic ruling class and that they weren't doing anything about it. But now they're getting kicked into gear by the, the parents, you know, these average middle and working class parents that aren't even necessarily registered Republicans or self-identified conservatives all the time pushing back and being like, you are not going to teach our kids this, right? Like, we love our country. You can't teach our kids this is an evil country. You can't teach our kids to hate each other based on race. We still believe in the principles of the Declaration of Independence, right? Like, that's America. America is not the sort of, you know, corporations with pride flags and, you know, gender studies programs for Saudi Arabia and all the things that we're used to, to complaining about, right? Like, America is the parents at the school board meeting demanding that teachers don't teach their children to hate each other based on the color of their skin, right? Like those people are Americans and those are the people that we should be fighting for. And, it, it, you know, as long as, as that energy is there, I think anyone who wants to turn on America or who, or who wants to give up uh, is just sort of preemptively de declaring defeat. And I'm, I'm, I'm really not interested in sort of hearing that perspective from people who say they're on the right. I, I think, though, that there, again, does have to be, I mean, this stuff came out of the college campuses at such a quick rate and the conservative movement didn't and wasn't able to respond effectively at all. Um, like, you know, a lot of these sort of ideas were already being attacked by people on the fringes in the 90s and 80s even, because um, they're already 
been there, but the conservative movement just refused to even acknowledge it. And so I think we're in a much deeper hole, though, than like, you know, Nate, I, I more or less agree with you, but I think like the actual situation is probably worse than it than it actually appears at times. Well, I'm not saying it's not bad. It's yeah. really bad. Yeah, it's 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 really bad. The um, um, I mean, Spencer, back towards the beginning of this discussion, said that we're we're winning and it's amazing. And then Seth <laughs> said, and they're losing, which is also amazing. <laughs> they're side of the same coin. But uh, yeah, I, I do want to throw some cold water on that. We, we need to get back to our small C conservative roots and say. <laughs> There's much work to be done. I mean, we need to use this CRT issue and the passion and righteous indignation that it stirs up to really march back through the educational institutions. As Matt as Matt has put on social media, to abolish the educational schools, that would be an awesome goal. To really finally de- abolish the Department of Education, uh, that was a Reagan goal. Uh, these things all really need to be done. Um, I'd settle for a, a severe haircut of the Department of Education and a repurposing, but... Um, no, there's there's tons of work to be done, but the the energy is is encouraging. Although the there's one dichotomy, it reminds me of the Tea Party, at least in the following sense: you have all these, as we've said, all these local people enraged by it, acting uh, together in concert, doing something about it, and then you have the National Republican uh, establishment who just declared Juneteenth the national holiday. Uh, uh, you know. As Spencer wrote recently on on Substack, it's fine to celebrate the the late uh, abolishment of slavery in Texas under General Order Number Three, but you know, no one, most of the country had never heard of Juneteenth before the la- recent weeks, and the left, of course, is using it as a weapon, as they always effectively do. To uh, you know, the more cynical folks are suggesting, you know, this is the first step on the road to really having Juneteenth replace the Fourth of July. I don't know if I'm quite that pessimistic, and I think the American people have uh, more spirit than to let that happen. But the contrast between the national GOP and its, uh, you know, kind of pusillanimous approach to uh, every time they're called racist or, or you know, sort of uh, badgered into doing something that's immediately weaponized against them is just uh, it's an it's an interesting contrast and a dispiriting one in many ways. Well, you know what's interesting to me about that declaration. Well, two things. One, there were no celebrations. I mean, ostensibly, right, this is a grand, you know, now we are all going to party because of how great, uh, you know, because of how great critical race theory is, essentially. The way that the left sort of presented this federal holiday, it was effectively like now we're going to have a, a, a point in our liturgical calendar, our national liturgical calendar in which we all must sort of pay obeisance to and like kneel wearing meaningless kente cloth in the floor of Congress or, or whatever. Right. But there was absolutely no party. There was just the declaration. I mean, it was oh, the most joyless kind of. What's hold that? on a second, Spencer. Yeah. Didn't you see the um, those people get dragged out of their car and shot on the street? <laughs> <in> Chicago? <laughs> Was that the, was that the party? I think that was part of the Juneteenth party. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the this is the first thing about it is right. Like, if if this is supposed to be about if this is actually supposed to be a celebration, it's they've got a funny way of of showing it. But the other the other thing about it is that it actually speaks to a tactic, which Seth you alluded to when you quoted Lenin and Ryan. It kind of, I think uh, we could take a, a a book out of the play or a leaf out of the playbook here when you're talking about needing to do so much more work, right? The, the next thing, when they win a victory like this, the next thing the cultural Marxists or whatever you want to call it, the, the critical race theory left, always says is, well, that was just, I mean, that's the bare minimum of what you should have done years ago. And now, here's the, all the other things that we want, right? Yeah. And Cory Bush says, like, you know, it's Juneteenth and reparations. It's Juneteenth and abolish the police, all of this stuff. I mean, the same thing happened after they got a guilty verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial. AOC was out here saying, don't don't think that this means the system works because there's so much more, you know, I mean, and you have to admire the hustle. I sort of feel as if that's kind of what we should be doing on in the CRT domain is like, yeah, OK, of course, of course, we should not be teaching children to hate each other on the basis of race. Of course, this poisonous garbage should never have been anywhere near anybody, you know, that wasn't like, you know, in an insane asylum and certainly not in the ears of our children. But there are, you know, 20 other things, gender theory, let's start there, 20 other things to like harry out with a whip of cords from the temple of American education. I, like there, there's certainly a rhetoric that we could take from the left on that, I think. Yeah, well, I, there's, a, there's a scramble for power and people seize on the, the possibility of controlling the concept of equality because they think, and you know, to a degree, they're they're right that 
that equality in America is power. Um, there's at a time when everything is losing so much power, so much competence, so much clarity, so much authority. The one thing that sticks out is still having some force behind it is American power. That America is still kind of the last superpower, and you know the the American state controls military technology on a scale that is still more powerful than you know the other leading brand and there's there's you know there's a, a cultural and a, a cold war of sorts over the control of that power um, and part of the consequence of that is that people are inclined to to worship American power this can this can be dangerous you know worshiping the the US government flexing its might wielding its terrible swift sword under these conditions, you know, that can lead to to the, the, the kinds of actions that we're seeing coming out of this administration that that suggest there is no logical stopping point to the the trajectory of of the federal flex. Indeed, what institution, you know, what group of people is strong enough to stop the government from flexing in whatever way it wants? That, you know, that is an indication that in some respects, America is very problematic. You know, I, because everything's problematic. But if you have this huge concentration of power at a time when, you know, what what ideas, what principles, what groups should rule is totally thrown into question, that's a big problem. Uh, and so, you know, to that extent, I understand why why people on the, the far left and the far right are desperate to convince themselves that America is a problem that can be solved or at least routed around. You know, they really don't like the idea that that they're stuck with America, that America is sort of this immovable object that has fixed qualities and characteristics as, as a territory with a certain kind of people, you know, that it's a, that it's a nation, that it's a, a civilization state. They don't like that. They want to find a way to make that not true. And the reality is that, you know, America isn't just going to go away. And the reality is that, you know, the, the, the flexing of American power is not going to purify America. It isn't going to fix America. Uh, you know, even the most optimistic version of this, which we heard Bill Clinton deliver once upon a time, you know, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed by what's right with America. You know, this, this, this idea that, that if only the right people with the right ideas and the right, you know, are, are given the keys to the ultimate power, then America will, you know, will either the problem of America will go away because America goes away or it'll somehow become this perfect regime. And, you know, both of those visions are fantasies. And as American power becomes so dissociated from any kind of, of shared feeling of authority or legitimacy, you know, that becomes very dangerous. I just say real quick about Juneteenth is kind of an example of a surfeit of power. It's almost like they don't know what to do with it. There was no celebration. It's actually in itself, you know, counter to the narrative. I mean, of course, going to use it as a weapon to flog everyone with, but it's kind of a, a weak weapon. And so, I mean, I was just tickled by this debate over whether or not you should celebrate it by eating fried chicken and red soda and watermelon. Um, and of course, you know, this seems very racist by some of the same people who support it and then others saying no and these kind of fake articles about how to celebrate it. And it was almost like they have so much power, they don't know what to do with it. They threw this in with the kitchen sink and it's just, uh, it's almost like it got lost in the shuffle. Like, yeah, sure, we'll take this holiday too and try to say uh, this is the real 4th of July or something. And that's a very bizarre thing. The other thing in relation to power, just to qualify uh, my own white pill at the beginning, I certainly agree with what Ryan said about how there's Tea Party aspects to this that they could go nowhere. So I'm curious uh, to hear more what the interns think about all these things. But I, I would just say, I mean, my the one my my black pill to everyone there was we don't really have examples of institutions that have actually been cleansed of this you know evil. So you do have parents rising up, but you know, show me the school system in which you've actually gotten rid of it. Well, that's going to take real concerted um, political effort and a kind of resurgence from within that we certainly don't see the leadership for right now on the right. And so it could be translated into something that's, uh, you know, cleansing a new kind of renaissance. But, you know, that's that's a that's a whole nother step. And it's exciting that there's this energy there that's positive. But, you know, show me the one institution in which it's actually not just been fought off, but it, you know, they got rid of it and it's already there. It's institutional and it's at the core.
this is again what I what I like about the idea of the right in America today as counter revolutionaries, right? I mean, the you can use the word conservative. I, I certainly use the word conservative, but it is true that like we're we are more staging a sort of counterinsurgency than we are really conserving anything about the the actual power structures in America today. And that I, I think to, to James's point, like when we're debating America, you know, what America is, should the right like America? There's just a definitional problem in, in what we mean by America. And that was that was my point earlier about how I think the the sort of anti-American right or the aspects of the right that flirt with a kind of anti-Americanism, just definitionally, in my opinion, don't understand what America is. Because I, I, I think, you know, when I, I think of myself and when I think of, of the right, or at least the, the base quadrants of the right as counter-revolutionaries, I think of us as defending America, traditionally understood. Uh, you know, the America of the founders regime, the America of the kinds of people that I meet when I drive across the country and, you know, hang out in Nebraska, right? The America of the, the parents at the parent-teacher meetings protesting critical race theory. Like, that's the America that we're fighting for. And that is America to me. Uh, and, and being counter-revolutionaries against a regime that is sort of this parasitic entity that has implanted itself in America um, doesn't make me anti-American. To me, it, it makes me pro-American. and It makes me fighting for America against a regime that is wholly both un-American and anti-American. And I think that is like the, the distinction that often gets lost, particularly in the sort of right-wing anti-American discourse. I, I will say, though, I think Part of the problem, and I mean, you're touching on this, is this problem of the institutions because literally every institution now is made up of people who graduated from woke universities, and, and that's only going to get worse. So, you know, even if we pass things against critical race theory, for instance, there's no guarantee that the teachers who went to Harvard won't be teaching kids critical race theory in subtle ways or won't be referencing it in class anyways. They call it cultural training in a lot of states now. Diversity yeah. training. Yeah. So like in, inevitably we have to face the fact that like political power just isn't enough. Like actually being in institutions is really crucial here and actually being able to construct narratives. And I don't see that the willpower for that happening yet. I, I'm, I, I hope that that can happen, but I don't see it yet. Well, it would be incumbent upon all of you to get after yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Michael here is uh, actually working, a about to start working on um, one of Claremont's projects in this regard, which is just, it's the first step, but our, our senior uh, Washington fellow, Scott Yenner, has been working on this, and uh, we're, we're building a start of a database on uh, all this, all basically all the required courses that one has to take as you enter college on diversity, equity, and inclusion, all the cultural bias training the faculty has to do, the extent to which college mission statements reflect it, and then the administrators or the provost that have been assigned to these sorts of things. Uh, at, we're going to start with the, the top 20 private universities and then ever, the top public university in every state. So it should be a, a revealing exercise, but there's just a mountain of work to be done, and, and uh, we need lots of institutions on the right working on it, both political and intellectual. I have a quick question for both, and you guys, uh, Wyatt and Michael, chime in as well if you like. But I'll start with Blaze. I want to talk a little bit with Nate and Blaze about their alma maters. Well, Blaze is still still in college, right, Blaze? Yeah. So, Blaze, you go to Azusa Pacific, a place where you have to sign a fa pledge of faith, and the faculty has to commit to not drinking liquor uh, and believing in Jesus Christ. Uh, but Azusa Pacific, uh, you know, has a pretty solid woke con contingent as well, doesn't it, Blaze? It sure does. It's definitely not the left, the left wing campus that you think of in like our UC schools or stuff like that. But there's definitely the battle between the people and the great books program, typically like the, that's what I'm doing there. And those who see that as just promoting whiteness. And, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that's definitely a battle on campus. The thing is, though, the conservatives on campus are a lot less vocal, even though they, they do seem to be in the majority. So, yeah, it, it does seem like without the faculty and uh, more political strength from the, the students, we're not going to be getting anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, you have ostensibly uh, Christian institutions. And this is a whole other topic we can get into some other time, but the, the, um, the failure of American Protestantism and even a good portion of evangelicalism to know what time it is is a big problem as well. Right. And, I mean, this is like, to Blaze's point, this is, I think, a broader problem with the kind of conservative activism we're talking about is just dispositionally, traditionally, conservatives are much less likely to be interested in 
being activists, getting in people's faces, going to protests uh, than, than left wingers are for, for any number of reasons. Um, but I mean, my college, Colorado College, is I think the diametric opposite, opposite in that it's very left wing. There was one conservative professor there, and that you know made all the difference for me because my ideological journey is I was raised by by left wing parents in, in Portland, Oregon, and you know originally moved right uh, as as a sort of a counter reaction to just what I saw on college campuses, um, but that I wouldn't have really been able to put that original reaction that I had into words and articulate it and actually, you know, understand it as part of a larger coherent ideology if I didn't have this one very good but very old conservative professor. And when he ages out, there won't be any more conservatives at the mm -hmm. college. And there are plenty of kids like me who, I mean, at any of these colleges, even the most left-wing colleges, there are a lot of young people, particularly young men, but not exclusively young men, who are completely disillusioned with the dominant campus culture and think it's ridiculous, but they don't have someone to actually like lead them through that thought process and take it to its logical conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that means that they're basically not going to be politically sort of, they won't sort of realize, I think, the end of that ideological journey, which ends up generally being some kind of right winger. If you don't have a conservative mentor or, or someone who at least like has that kind of worldview to lead you through it. I was lucky enough to have this one professor who could, you know, send me conservative essays to read, right? You know, send me the sort of Strauss and Michael Oakeshott and all these, 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 these people that I read in college. But again, like he will be gone soon. And then that college will basically, yeah, you know, there won't be any access to those things for students. And that's, that is also like a huge issue for conservatives, right? When we talk about sort of retaking institutions, this has to be part of the conversation because just one conservative in, in these places can make a huge difference. Um, and, and the lack of conservatives in these places means that you have a lot of potential right-wingers, people who could be moved into our coalition who aren't going to be because they don't have someone to, to actually have that discussion with. Yeah, it makes the case for a multi-pronged strategy while we need to build new institutions and, and continue to grow forgive the use of that word as a verb, to grow institutions like Hillsdale and others. It's also, we shouldn't, um, shouldn't they say too much the importance of, uh, and a lot of these places, it doesn't take much money of planting, even with some funding. So conservative donors out there, it's still worthwhile to plant uh, a conservative, even if they're kind of ghettoized and separate on campus, it, it still helps while we, while we build the new things. Yeah, I would agree with that. Although I, w I will say, I mean, the degree to which conservative professors on at least like, you know, I, I went to DePaul. It's an extremely left left wing school. It's ostensibly Catholic, but the <laughs> Catholics have less room on campus than the uh, Muslims and every other faith group. So it's barely Catholic. But um, just the extent to which, like, for instance, you know, one of my professors, Jason D. Hill, he's been on Fox News, et cetera, um, has just been maligned by both the administration and the students makes me skeptical that just having one professor can can change things because it's you know he's not even a extreme rightist in any respect he's a conservative democrat i think um and you know he gets death threats so we're dealing with a very 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 hard time here yeah. uh, to seize the institutions what about you michael what's your experience yeah, I would say, you know, going to a UC school, there really isn't much hope in the humanities, uh, at least from my experience. I think what I was able to find were a lot of, I guess you can say, centrist or um, even sort of Reagan era conservatives and the economics, uh, some parts of the history department, uh, nothing really in poli sci. But surprisingly, yeah. a lot more hope in the STEM field, which I guess seems a bit counterintuitive uh, to a certain extent. But I think I noticed that whenever there were certain movements on campus, especially on my campus as regards uh, the BDS movement, which was always very virulent in attacking um, the administration and the student senate because we're the only UC student senate which has not chosen to divest from uh, Israel you know, and everything related to that. Um, I think it was interesting to see how in those moments it wasn't necessarily as, as why it was saying conservatives who were speaking up, but really even, yeah, people nominally democratic, but who, who were realizing how this, this kind of radical ideology was, was infecting and really causing the academic environment to, to, be, to be cheapened and, and worsened. Um, but, you know, I think I, I agree with, and would want to echo your sentiments, Ryan, as, as regards the need for 
in in these in these large public institutions, there's not necessarily much hope for completely flipping them around, but there is hope for creating a, a burrowing, so to speak, that that allows some some common sense, a voice that can be what that professor was for Nate, uh, guiding those those students who don't want to be completely enveloped by the the rain the reigning ideology on campus. Yeah, I think as wokeness invades STEM fields, there'll be more opportunities for um, coalition building as well. Um, you know, I mean, med schools, it's spreading everywhere. Um, as we all know, math and engineering are, are racist and white supremacist, so. Uh, I just, I don't even understand how those, I mean, it, it, wokeness, obviously, it can, it can sort of infect in any field, but it's it's so confusing to me. Like, are, are, are math majors gonna be reading Angela Davis now? I, yeah. I, don't, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't, I feel like if I was a math major, I'd be like, this wasn't what I signed up for, even if I was pretty left wing, but. yeah. But yeah. This is just how it's accelerating. Like you, you can never even, you know, unless you're totally on top of it, it's very difficult to even be able to predict just how bad it's going to get next week because it, it just keeps getting worse and worse. It's almost as if, I mean, it's almost as if everything conservatives said, you know, 15 years ago about um, the slippery slope with a lot of social conservative issues um, was totally accurate. But it's actually turning out to be accurate in ways I think they didn't even anticipate. That's true enough. Uh, you know, professors are one thing. What about students? Uh, if you were advising a high school kid going into college and looking at, you know, okay, let's say they've got offers on the table. They can go to an Ivy League school and get a fancy degree, but basically be, you know, uh, factory assembled uh, production lined into woke dogma. They can go to one of these schools where the conservatives are holding on by a finger uh, and maybe they'll get one great mentor. Uh, or they can go to, say, Hillsdale or Thomas Aquinas, one of these kind of bastion holdouts. Um, what would you advise? Uh, do we silo ourselves and our, our kids into places where they're going to get a good education but, like, not be able to fight the fight, or do we send them off to take the institutions back from within? Well, I, it depends probably what your long-term goal is. If you if you want to sort of make six figures out of college and do quite well for yourself and be respectful, I would go to Harvard and keep your head down and shut up and don't 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 ask questions. Uh, I think if if you're <laughs> you know interested in being a well-rounded human being and you know uh, nourishing the soul, I would I would go to Hillsdale. I, I think like you know not every kid has the fire in their belly where they're willing to sort of take on the entire campus and uh, you know make a lot of enemies right out of the gate to fight the fight. And we can't expect every 18 year old kid to do that. Like we, it's, it's difficult to put that on those kids. I'm, you know, uh, I, I, I'm sort of an ornery person to start out with. So I think I'm an exception where I, you know, by sophomore year I was starting a conservative magazine and I didn't, you know, I was, I, I didn't mind getting in fights with activists, but like it's completely reasonable for kids to, to, to not want that and just to want to have a normal college experience. Uh, I, I tend to think that like the, the actual quality of education you're going to get somewhere like Hillsdale is much better than sort of an elite small liberal arts college these days. As in terms of like the broad sort of strategic question for the conservative movement, yeah, it would be great to have a, set in a lot of like really based 18 year old, 19 year old kids into Harvard so that we actually had like a locus point of resistance in those places. But again, like the average 18 year old kid just wants to go along to get along. They're I, not interested. I think the I think the best way to answer this question and the way I would answer it though is that if I was talking to an 18 year old kid, I, I, I was I would just tell them like things are going to get worse in the immediate future. Why um, are you just dispensing black pill after yeah. <laughs> Like, I <laughs> think, that, <laughs> I think bad, the next uh, 10, 10 to 20 years, this is still going to be going on. Um, it's, it's going to have its own institutional and, and structural problems that will eventually, it, it won't last forever. But in the immediate near future, the next 10, 20 years, um, it's going to keep going on. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, do I want to go along with it and be inside and be ready to help change it? Or do I want to just be permanently relegated to the outside? And, you know, I'm sorry to say, but I mean, if you're at Hillsdale, you are permanently relegated to being outside the, you know, the structures of power at this point. And so, 
I don't know if that's quite true, um, but it's not that bad yet. <laughs> if you go to DC, I mean, you can't. You can't. Walk DC is maybe the glaring exception. You're yeah. probably right about like going to have a nice Goldman job. But, yeah, but I you, mean, you can go be a lawyer for an administration that's you know a pariah. Uh, like the Trump administration, like but I mean, even even things like culture matter, though. So, like, you yeah. know, if you if you wanted to go and st- if it if you were talking to an eighteen year old who wanted to go, who's conservative, who wanted to go study music administration, I don't know what the actual degree would be, but um, I would tell them, you know, go to the Harvard one as opposed to the Hillsdale one. Not that Hillsdale actually has that, but right. just because these institutions are very important to take back. Film school, another good example. Yeah, for example, yeah, go. yeah. Um, yeah, I think I partly answer your question, Spencer. I think I would advise parents, um, and uh, you know, my wife and I are facing this question squarely now. Matt, Matt has long dealt with it, uh, having older children than me. You know, as to you, you can do a lot of inoculation in K through twelve, and you need to start doing it in kindergarten, and yeah. then you can be a little more comfortable if you have a solid religious life at home. Uh, you have raised your children responsibly to the best that you can, and have. Uh, prevented them from being infected by brain worms early you know you can you can have a little more confidence that they're not just going to wholly go over the other side when you send them away to to college in fact they may you know turn out more more like nate uh, which is to even if even if they keep their head down they kind of like a lot of students do these days they they go, they'll, they'll go through the motions but they're not gonna they're not gonna become converts to the doctrine or the dogma i think the key though unless you're going to be going to a college like Hillsdale or Thomas Aquinas, is you need to make sure that you're going to find a good conservative community to be around. And not just your social media community, but like actual people who you can yeah. talk to. And, and that's how you're going to get nourished, even if your classes aren't doing that for you. Yeah. And it's hard to, it's hard to recommend going to a place where the educational experience is pretty much worthless, you know, even if it's prestigious, because that's just a waste of money, among other things. So, yeah. And, you know, like Harvey Mansfield's still at Harvard. Like, I think a lot of these places, like, it's, it's possible to get a high quality education. It's just not served to you on a platter like it used to be. You have to really work and look mm-hmm. for it. You have to find the correct professors, because you, if you yeah. coast, you, you often and won't get a good education. I, I think there's also a point to be made that you don't need to go to college to be conservative. I mean, there are yeah. basic things that if, if you can just learn and, and remember in your day-to-day life, you know, remember that all people are created in the divine image. Um, remember that America is not a bad place. Like, just these very basic ideas. And if you can hold on to those, I think, you know, when all of this eventually goes away and eventually is figured out and eventually we get a better better sort of cultural system going um, and, and get our political system back on track. I think um, being able to just hold on to those very basic things will be more than enough. Any uh, quick closing comments from our, from our editors? <laughs> These guys, are, these guys are pretty good. We should put them on a podcast or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Well, uh, thanks, gents. This was fun. I uh, hope the audience likes it. And uh, as always, thank you all for listening to The Roundtable. If you want to support our work, visit claremont.org slash donate. If you want to learn more about all our projects and writing, visit our websites at americanmind.org, claremont.org, claremontreviewbooks.com, and our new Center for the American Way of Life at dc.claremont.org. Please rate, share, and subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to Jake Gannon and Annalisa Lee, the production and engineering crew. And thank you all for listening. Talk to you next week. There's Dr. Clavin, although headless. (laughs) Very well, thank you. I'm noticing that I've I had to adjust my camera for a, a different hit, and now I'm like very very short. You're short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I should change that. But otherwise, I'm doing well. So we'll all get cancer, <laughs> but we'll have high speed Wi-Fi anywhere. For breakfast this morning, as usual, I drank the tears of my enemy and inhaled the pure vapor of liberal the rage. <laughs> Yes, the um, the Claremont Review of Books is published quarterly by the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy. America's the best regime, one, two, three. <laughs>
America's best regime. One, two, three. The perfect resolution of the uh, reason problem revelation. of reason Athens revelation. One, one, two, three. What has Athens to do with Jerusalem? <laughs> it's like the nerdiest <laughs> sound check ever. This may be. This may very well be the nerdiest sound check I've ever heard. <laughs> it's from that Washington Post. It's uh, WAPO, yeah. What about being white? Are you proud of? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Even though his videos on, I believe his internet is shit. <laughs> That's the scientific you, term. The yeah. term. Yeah. <laughs> Never back down, never surrender. Yeah, never apologize. <laughs>